Welcome back to Social Studies. We are on Chapter 9, Lesson 4, page 247. It says, Women in the Colonies. The wives of wealthy colonial men lived comfortable lives. Yet they also had many responsibilities. Franklin had little time to give to his printing shop. So he was a printer by trade. So if I wanted copies for my school class, I could go to a printer shop and they could make me copies. I'd have to pay because that was their business. Now, it's not usually the typical way teachers make copies because teachers didn't necessarily make copies that way. But um, if I wanted a flyer put out, if I don't have a printer at my house, I have to go to a printer and they will have to print the things that I needed po to post. So it says, Franklin had little time to give to his printing shop because of his many other activities. So Deborah Franklin, his wife, ran much of the business. She also ran the busy Franklin household and took care of their three children. So his wife, in a time where wives didn't necessarily run businesses, she ran their printing business and took care of their three kids. Poor women worked hard raising families and helping on the farms. Although the work of colonial women helped to keep farms and businesses running, they had few rights except for those allowed by their husbands. So if your husband wouldn't let you do something, you didn't get to do it. To improve their lives, some women began to start their own shops and businesses. A number of colonial women became highly successful. Um, so let's look at the map for a second. English settlements along the Atlantic coast by 1760. Now notice, a little bit of Michigan has settled up here. Um, you've been to Michigan? We live in Michigan. Beginning about the early 1600s, colonial colonists pushed the frontier along the Atlantic coast farther west. So we talked about this a little bit. Which colonies had no English settlements before 1660? So this is land settled between 1700 and 1760. Land settled between 1660 and 1700. Land settled between the early 1600s and 1660. Which colonies had no English settlements before 1660? Well, did South Carolina have English colonies before 1660? Which ones had land... Uh, colonies before 1660. It can't be anybody in the what color? Can't be anybody in the red. So South Carolina would work, North Carolina would work. Is there red in Virginia? Yes. Is there red in Delaware? A little bit way up at the tippy top. What about New Jersey? Is there red in New Jersey? A little bit there. A uh, little bit there. It looks like that might be part of Pennsylvania. So basically, it's just North Carolina and South Carolina. Which city was settled earlier? Was it Charlestown, South Carolina, or New Haven, Connecticut? Which one was settled earlier? Charlestown, South Carolina, right here. And that's in what color? Orange or New Haven, Connecticut. So if I New Haven, Connecticut, it's right here. And what color is that? Red. Right. Right. Who was settled earlier? Red. I'm asking this one. What is it? Which city was settled earlier? Charlestown, South Carolina, or New Haven, Connecticut? Connecticut, because it's in the red. That was the earliest. 
How did the settling of the land after the 1700s help the colonies grow? After the 1700s, which direction did the colonies head? Where's the land moving at? It is moving west, and some of it looks like it might be moving south and west, right? Because these were after the 1700s. So all this yellow, it's moving west, and it's moving south and west. From city to frontier, the settling of the colonies followed a geographic pattern. Settling of the colonies followed a geographical pattern. At first, most settled on the Atlantic coastal plain. We saw that in the with the map, right? These rich lands were good for growing crops. Their location near waterways made them ideal for trade. Colonists built successful farms, businesses, and cities there. The map on this page shows you that important colonial cities like Boston, Philadelphia and Charlestown were located on the coastal plain. They were near the Atlantic coast. By the middle of the 1700s, most of the coastal land was owned by wealthy planters. Thus, many colonists could not afford to buy land there. If somebody was wealthy, are they going to be likely to sell or not sell? Not sell unless they were desperate up for money, right? Because if you had plantations on the south, uh, on the Atlantic coast, is it going to be easy to get them to the market? Yeah, but the farther away you go, it's going to be harder. It's going to take a longer trip to get them to market. New York. Um, Colonists began to move west to the frontier to an area they called the back country. The back country is the name that these colonists gave to the rugged land near the Appalachian Mountains. Geogra Geography of the back country. The back country began in the foothills between the Atlantic coastal plain and the Appalachians or the Piedmont. The Piedmont stretches across the middle colonies and part of southern colonies. Farming in the back country was difficult. The land was often rocky and uneven, with few large rivers and waterways on which to transport goods. Without large waterways, colonists found it difficult to reach the Piedmont. To get there, many colonists followed trails begun by Native Americans long before. One of the most often used trails led to the Shenandoah Valley. Find this valley on the map on page 248. Can you find the Shenandoah Valley? So here's the Appalachian Mountains. This is the Shenandoah Valley. Um... They actually, the Appalachian Mountains actually has a trail that you can start, I think, in Maine and walk the trail of the Appalachian Mountains, um, like from Maine all the way down. You can walk the Appalachian Mountains. I have not walked it. I have met people who walked the whole trail, though. Do you like to walk How long does it take? Uh, it takes months. So, what? like, yeah, months. So, like, people... So what people do is, like, they hike with a backpack on. They have to figure out about when they're going to reach each city. And what they'll do is they start somewhere, and you you can hike part of it and not the whole thing. Um, but I've met a Girl Scout who's walked the whole thing, um, and she's walked parts of it several times. Um, but she started in one place, and what you have to do is you mail yourself packages to certain cities along the, the town, so or certain places along the thing. Otherwise, you have to carry all your food, right? So one guy I met one time when I was in college, he was a speaker. He mailed himself. He bought macaroni and cheese and, like, cheesy rice, and he had one other dinner. So 
by the time he got done walking it for three months, like June, July, and August or whatever, he was so sick of cheese he couldn't stand it. But um, what you do is you you prepackage meals that will hold, right? Because you can't eat hot dogs or hamburgers or whatever. So the only thing that you can carry is food that you can cook over an open fire, right? What about a banana? Well, if you buy fruit or fruits and vegetables, you have to buy them pretty regularly when you walk into a town or whatever, right? And so if you're going to send yourself sweet, you eat lots of trail mix, lots of nut mixtures, lots of, you know, quick or really high protein, major carb types of stuff. And then they said uh, occasionally they would run into other people who were camping on the trail and they would let them eat with them. All right, we're going to keep moving and then if we have time we'll go back. Settlers of the back country. Most people who settled in the back country lived a rugged life. Both men and women had to work to survive. Their houses were often made of roughly cut logs. So imagine dropping a tree and you just cut the branches off and they use that to build your house with. Have you ever played with Lincoln Logs before? Yeah. Think about Lincoln Logs, that's kind of what their houses look like. Yeah, it's kind of like you just, you just rough it up enough so that it fits. The other thing you can think about is um, sometimes they would make mud houses or houses out of dirt. Uh, Adobe out west, yes. Yep. Sometimes they did. They actually have um, roofs at Greenfield Village, I think, made out of sticks and twigs or whatever. What? That's a real possibility. What? Well, the house I went in last year had holes in its roof, so yeah, clearly rain would come in. All right. Um, many back backcountry people carried rifles wherever they went and spent most of the day hunting. Does that sound like who? From what book? Matt from Sign of the Beaver, right? We haven't read about hunting and Freedom Crossing yet, right? Other than hunting slaves. All right. Um, still, others became wealthy. The family of two United States presidents were among the first colonists who settled in the back country. What brought these people to the back country? Many back country people were poor. A Scottish immigrant named Alexander McAllister described North Carolina back country as the best poor man's country. I have heard in this age. McAllister told relatives that a person might make it rich very fast there. It was a place where people could breathe the air of liberty. So this is a picture of the beautiful Shenandoah Valley in Virginia. And then it says colonists in the back country played the handmade dulcimer and fiddle. So this is a dulcimer and this is a Okay, turn the page. You're going to have to wait, my friend. In 1762, the uh, this picture is 1762. The Cherokee chief, Kuhn Schott, posed for this portrait with some belongings that were important to him. Native Americans in the back country. Um, I think the coat's over his arm, because it looks like, I think it's right here. I think the coat's draped over it. All right, the colonists who came to the back country were moving into lands that had long belonged to Native Americans. In some cases, the colonists and the Native Americans got along well. Trade between these Native Americans and the colonists helped both groups. However, good trading relations did not stop problems from arising. 
Some colonists captured and enslaved Native Americans. In the Yarmouthy War of 1715, fighting broke out between the colonists of North Carolina and the Yamasi, Muskegee, and Cherokee. The Native Americans almost defeated the colonists. However, the Native Americans had to surrender when the Cherokee switched sides and joined the colonists in exchange for trade goods. So they would have won if the Cherokee wouldn't have changed sides. Why it matters. Be always employed in something useful, Benjamin Franklin wrote in his autobiography. Franklin lived by these words. Though his, through his hard work and intelligence, he became wealthy and respected throughout the colonies. Franklin's life was one example of the opportunities that were attracting people to growing colonies. Not everyone shared equally in these opportunities. Enslaved people had little opportunity. Poor immigrants had hard lives. All of these different people in the colonies were working to build a new country. Although England still ruled the colonies, the colonists were slowly but surely becoming Americans. So they're slowly but surely changing the way they think because they're living somewhere else and they're changing the things that they find important. Main ideas. People from many different lands lived throughout the English colonies in the 1700s. Benjamin Franklin arrived in Philadelphia in 1723. He helped the city of Philadelphia in many ways. As a result of high land prices on the Atlantic coastal plain, Many colonists settled in the back country near the Appalachian Mountains. Making a difference, getting the news out. New York, New York, meet 16-year-old Scarlett Arias and 18-year-old Osiris Adarno. These two teenagers talk. When these two teenagers talk, people listen. About 3 million of them. Scarlett and Osiris work for the New York office of Children's Express. You have to read about Benjamin Franklin's newspaper, the Pennsylvania Gazette. Instead of writing stories for one newspaper, paper, excuse me, the students at Children's Express gather and write news stories that appear weekly in newspapers across the country. Children's, Ex Children's Express reporters are 8 to 13 years old. The editors arrange in age from 14 to 18. Teenagers at news offices in Indianapolis, Indiana, Washington, D.C., and New York work without pay to research and write news stories for a variety of news sources. Children's Express calls itself the news service by children for everybody, explains Scarlett. Our stories give a young person's point of view on issues from government to life in homeless shelters. Spot, stories spotlight whatever affects children. The Children's Express News teams know that citizens need to be informed about many issues. Their readers have followed Children's Express stories on elections for President of the United States since 1976. News teams have also interviewed people running for other offices, local voters, and such elected of Oh my gosh, can't read today. And such elected officials as senators and mayors. We also talk to kids about the issues that concern them directly, says Osiris. We cover the things that kids hear about or see around them every day. We try to find out what kids are thinking about. That includes school dropouts and gang members. In 1997, Children's Express editors traveled to Dakar, Bangladesh to report on children in the workforce. Scarlett believes her years of working on the news stories have helped her in another way. What I've gained the most is confidence that my voice can be heard. My voice can be heard. That's her right there. 
All right. Um. He said there's two feet in the box. Since you know where the apron is. Oh, maybe this is Osiris. I don't know. He doesn't look. O that's that's why I was guessing that was her. Um, I want you to be bop back to. I think I have enough time to do this really quick. Reading climographs. Okay. Uh, two forty two. Climograph. Why this skill matters. In the last lesson, so this was a lesson ago. You read that many people came to the English colonies in the early 1700s. The climate in the colonies was sometimes very different from the climate that the newcomers from Europe were used to. One way they could have compared climates would have been by looking at a climograph. A climograph is a graph that shows information about the temperature and precipitation of a place over time. Climo climate. So what's our weather precipitation? I'm not storing right now, but thank you though. A climograph is useful because it gives a picture of weather for each month. Today, farmers use climographs to decide when the climate will most likely be right for planting. That's what I said my dad used to use the farmer's almanac for, right? To figure out when was the good time to plant. Um, climographs tell travelers what kind of weather to expect when they take a trip. Scientists use climographs to predict weather might increase the chance of such things as forest fires and floods. So this is a barometer was used to forecast the weather in the 1700s. Barometer tells when, um, a barometer is about pressure, so when the pressure is rising, when the pressure is falling, which signifies there's going to be a weather change. Using the skill. So if you look at this, this is Climograph A. It's Boston, Massachusetts. So this is the average monthly precipitation, January, February, March. January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December. So the average monthly precipitation, and this is the average monthly temperature right there. Uh, look at the climograph for Boston, Massachusetts. Notice that there is really two graphs in one. There is a bar graph, which tells us the monthly precipitation, right? And a line graph, and the line graph tells us the monthly temperature. Average monthly, monthly temperature. To understand a climograph, we're going to read the same way that you would read other kinds of graphs. First, you're going to look at the title Climograph A. Right here's the title. Oops, let me drop it down. That's Climograph A is the title. Now look at the labels and the scales and measurement on the sides of the climograph. The precipitation scale is shown on the left. So this is average monthly precipitation. This is in inches. So it goes from 0 inches all the way up to 20 inches of precipitation. So rain, sleet, snow, or hail is precipitation. Um, it is measured in inches. We know it's measured in inches because there's the inches mark. The temperature scale is shown on the right. So here's the temperature. The temperature goes from 0 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, right? Uh, it is measured in degrees Fahrenheit. The bar graph uses vertical bars to show Boston's average monthly pre precipitation. The line graph shows the average monthly temperature. So it's average monthly temperature. It's not the high temperature. It's not the low temperature. It's the average. So if you look at, if you look at our month of February, we would have had some really low lows, right, because it got pretty cold. And we had some really high highs, but they want to know what's the average. What's um, um, During July, Boston had the highest temperature. So if you go to July, here's my July. If I follow July all the way up here, the highest temperature is about what? Average is about 75. Does it look like it's about 75? 
You guys see what I did? Yeah. yeah. July, if I, fought, if I made a line with pencil, which I'm not going to, and I go over here, it's between 70 and 80, so it's probably about 75, 76. Very cool. So during July, Boston had the highest temperature and the lowest amount of rainfall. So if you look at the rain, average 4 inches, less than 4 inches, about 4 inches, less than 4 inches, a little bit less. July is the lowest bar right here, right? Trying the skill, climb a graphs B and C, which are all the way down here, B and C. Give temperature and precipitation information for Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and Charleston, South, Charlotte, Char, Charleston, South Carolina. Take a look at the temperature graphs. What is Philadelphia's average temperature in March? So if you look at Philadelphia's average temperature in March, so here's the Philadelphia graph. I go down to March. What is its average temperature for March? You are looking at me. You are not right. You either look at my screen or you look down at your book. Philadelphia's average temperature for March. Okay, so if I follow my March, follow it over here. It's 40, you're right. Then it says, um, what about Charleston's? What's the average mon monthly temperature for March in Charleston? So I'm going to go to March, up to the green. I'm going to follow it across. What's the average temperature for March in Charleston? Uh, this is March. If I follow March over, it's not even to 60, my friend. So it's about 58 degrees. Then it says, how do the temperatures of Philadelphia and Charleston compare in August? So if I go to August, I follow the August bar up. What is the average temperature for August in Pennsylvania? August 72, 73, maybe even closer to 75 because it's almost halfway. What about Charleston, Charlotte, Charleston, South Carolina? Oh my gosh, I can't talk today. August 72, 73. Ooh, I did not want to hang out there. So it's higher. It's higher. Now let's look at this. This is in the, this is in the, what region? Philadelphia is in what, like eastern, middle colonies or southern colonies? Uh, it might be eastern got to be close to eastern I think. Let me see how they specifically separated it up. What about um so the middle colonies was New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware and it was Philadelphia. I think it's eastern. Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Connecticut. Nope, Philadelphia would be Pennsylvania, right? So what about in the middle colonies? What about um, South Carolina? Where's South Carolina found at? Southern, Colony. Southern colonies. So middle colonies is cooler than the Southern colonies. Um, then the next question is, 
Uh, what about December? In Philadelphia, it's about 30, 32, 33. What about uh, South Carolina is 51, 52, 53? Now, which month has the greatest amount of precipitation for each city? Who is the great, which month has the greatest amount for precipitation? So precipitation, you're looking at the bar graphs. Which bar is the highest one for each one? This one's the highest, right? So that would be August. And then this one is July, yep. Um, which month has the least amount of precipitation for both of those? Nope, you're looking down here. Which one has the smallest graph? Oh, yeah. October is the biggest month. October and February here. What about here? Which one has the least amount here? November. November. Yep, good job. Um, now look at the connections between the temperature and the precipitation in the climograph. Does warm weather increase or decrease the chance of precipitation? So if this is warm weather, is the the rain higher or lower here? What about here? Is it higher or lower here? Higher. So it looks like, the, at least in the graph C, the higher the temperature, the more likely it is that it's going to be raining. All right, so um, helping yourself, I'm going to read that, and then I'm going to get you to work. Um, helping yourself, a climograph to shows some precipitation of a place over a period of time. Um, now let's look at homework, and then I have a couple things to do before we do the homework. Boom, boom, boom. All right, you have an interview from Benjamin Franklin. You need to do, how did your wife Deborah Franklin help with all the things you had to do? Why do you think many colonists began moving to the back country in the middle of the 1700s? And then what do you think are the keys to success? Okay. All right, we will talk to you later. Bye.